Welcome on board the Rich Planet Starship, broadcasting from somewhere high above the Earth. I'm Richard D. Hall, and I'm going to kick things off by taking a look at some of this week's news items. First off, Barack Obama has cancelled any future manned missions to the Moon. Uh, the last one was in 1972, and astronauts were incensed by this decision. And one day, perhaps, we'll learn the real reason for this decision. An alleged suicide bomber in the UK tried to gain employment as a temporary cabin crew member in order to carry out a terrorist attack. IT expert Rajiv Karam, aged 30, allegedly indicated that he could be trained to stand in for the striking cabin crew and offered to use it as an opportunity for a terrorist attack. Prosecutor Colin Gibbs said that Karim had a clear intention and desire to offer himself for terrorist attacks and achieve martyrdom. Now I would say, how do you know that someone has the intention until they've actually carried out the attack? This smells to me of another, yet another, false flag event by the intelligence agencies. And it's almost as preposterous as the underpant bomber case. Um, Moving on, and in New York City, officials have agreed to pay up $657 million to thousands of rescue workers who, who were working in the cleanup event after 9-11. The settlement would compensate more than 10,000 plaintiffs who say they were made sick by dust at the ground zero site of the attacks. Now, what is significant for this um, to me is the fact that the authorities are admitting that there was huge quantities of strange dust that no one has an explanation for at the site of 9-11. Now, does this not add weight to the theory that some kind of advanced energy weapon was used to bring the towers down? Moving on, and it's, because it's, it's come to our attention that strange planet-sized spheres um, some people are calling UFOs have been photographed in close proximity to the Sun. The images were taken by NASA's SOHO unmanned spacecraft which monitors the Sun and broadcasts images of the Sun on its website. The spheres are about the size of planet Earth and started showing up around about the 18th of January this year. Now NASA have passed these images off as mere compression artifacts, highly magnified. In other words, there's some kind of photographic anomaly. But um, some people believe that NASA are, are continuing to cover up these images and people are coming up with various different theories such as the objects are in fact um, spacecraft entering our solar system through the sun and the sun is a stargate which connects to a black hole in another galaxy. Okay, and finally, on Sunday the 7th of March, uh, during the night over a quiet Somerset house, scores of swooping starlings tumbled out of the sky for no apparent reason and landed in somebody's front garden. More than 100 birds were found, each with blood oozing from its beak and curled up claws. It's a mystery and no one seems to have an explanation for this bizarre event. One would assume that possibly some kind of gas or chemicals caused this, but you would then think, well, what on earth is poisonous gas doing in the air above Somerset? Okay, it's time to introduce this week's guest. And I've interviewed uh, our, th this week's guest many times before. He's an expert in ufology. He's an expert in animal mutilation and crop circles. So without further ado, let's activate the teleporter and get him beamed up onto the ship. David Caton. Welcome, David. Have a seat. Welcome on board the Starship, David. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. How did you very find pleased the, to be here. How did you find the teleportation? Well, okay. I, I'm on tablets for vertigo, so ah. it's perhaps a good thing. Right. <laughs> I don't okay. want to look after the window too much, you see. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway, first of all, I'd like to say how delighted I am and, and uh, pleased to be your first guest on the launch of your Starship. Okay. Enterprise. Well, and thanks hope, for coming. Hope in. it goes successfully, and um, perhaps you'll get Captain Kirk on one day. Well, well, perhaps. <laughs> who knows? Right. Well, you've come in today, David, or you've we've beamed you up today to talk about British ufology that you've been involved with for sort of the last 
20 years or so, yeah, so and yeah. from the late 19, 1980s. And yeah, yeah. how did you get involved? Who, who, who yeah. was it that sort of got you involved in the ufology yeah. scene originally? Well, it was uh, Roy Dudden, mm -hmm. who him and I were still working at British Aerospace. I think it was 1989. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, all my comments are sort of just my perception and my personal um, things that happened mm -hmm. interfacing with ufologists and so on. So I haven't made a, a particular study of ufology mm -hmm. from A to Z, you know, for me. Yeah. Anyway, it was Roy who uh, triggered me off and uh, showed me crop circle pictures over the lunch table and this sort of thing. And he said, uh, why not sign up and subscribe to the Bufora magazine? Bufora, that's British UFO oh, Research, Research Association, Association, I believe, okay. yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was quite expensive then. It was like it was twenty-five pounds a year or something. Mm -hmm. And I was quite disappointed with the magazine. It was quite boring and very no illustrations and nothing exciting. It really fired me up. Mm -hmm. And I got the sort of feeling from editorial comments and things that the the people running the magazine, the editorial team, were somewhat more than sceptical. Mm -hmm. Non non-believers, I think, a lot of them. Well, I didn't perceive that at the time, uh, but yes. People in Bufora tend to try and explain everything away in, in, in normal everyday terms. Would you, yeah. would you agree with that? Yes, and again, objective to attempt to do that, you could argue, is not a bad thing mm -hmm. in essence, mm -hmm. but uh, I think as time's gone on, they've probably got, gone over the top on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it has the effect of putting people off. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I didn't renew after 12 months of subscription. I didn't sponsor another 25 quid for some boring stuff. And I think uh, Roy also discontinued. Right. So I was, I've never been a member of a Bufora group, right. UFO group, right. or anything like that. So that was probably the main, you know, establishment group, if you could call it that. Yes, I think. Uh, I think and Quest International, who you joined yeah. in 93, yeah. was probably a bit more open-minded, would you say? Yes, and they, they came along from a, an original, uh, I think it was called the U Yorkshire UFO Group, right. where about the, Graham and Mark Birdsell mm -hmm. kicked it off, mm -hmm. and then Tony Dodd joined them. Mm -hmm. I think well, he was probably still a serving officer originally. I'm not too sure. Mm -hmm. I imagine retired. And they started the magazine. Uh, and they the eventually UFO started magazine. the ma UFO magazine, yes. which I was very impressed with. That. Yes, I've uh, seen copies of that, and yeah. it, it is a superb, or was a superb yeah. magazine. It's not running mm -hmm. anymore now. But Tony, as a personality, was the guy that really fired me up. And I thought if he'd stuck his head over the parapet by reporting a, a sighting on duty with two other officers in 1978, I think it was, mm -hmm. and despite the wishes of the two other two guys, he. Uh, made a formal report to his superiors, which mm -hmm. <laughs> actually uh, affected his police career and his mm -hmm. promotion. Mm -hmm. uh, so I thought, if a guy to do that, that would impress mm -hmm. me. So when I took a retirement of, from British Aerospace in January 93, mm -hmm. later in the year, I contacted Tony and said, uh, do you need another researcher, investigator for the Greater Manchester area? And he mm -hmm. said, so I'd give him background of what I'd been doing, and he said, yeah, fine, sign me up. Mm -hmm. Got my badge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> should, should have mm -hmm. brought. Um, and, and you then started going to conferences in Leeds, I believe? Yes, they didn't have a formal conferences in those days. Right. They had informal meetings at an old building called Centenary House in Leeds. Mm -hmm. I think it was monthly. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a very relaxed, open sort of forum thing. Mm -hmm. Graham and Mark would talk about certain subjects and topics. Mm -hmm. uh, they would invite people from the floor mm -hmm. who had some experience to come up. They even got me on my feet mm -hmm. twice, I think, right. to, about some events in the Manchester area. And then eventually they decided to invite outside keynote speakers. And they right. got uh, Bob Dean had uh, speak there, mm -hmm. and uh, Colonel Wendell, Wendell Stevens, Stevens yeah. yeah. And they, they were terrific. You know. yeah, yeah. And then it, Graham, I think, eventually um, started to do more formal public conferences. Mm -hmm. and, and it sort of went on from there. Okay. And was it that group that covered the alien autopsy? Did they have that at their conference? And I think 95, or was that a different group? <coughs> no, no, it was Quest. It was Quest. The, every, I mean, everyone was talking about it because in 95, that's when Ray Santilli yes. actually released this. this Alien Earth. autopsy yeah. video for Yeah, the earth-shaking yes. thing, which was going to be the smoking gun for yes. ufology and all that. Yes. And uh, it's supposed to be yeah. 1940s cine film uh, yeah. of, a, of an alien, an alien body. body. Yeah. And, and surgeons, you know, taking yeah. the organs yeah. out and cutting it up, etc. Yeah. 
And uh, I just mentioned that uh, the uh, Keith Goodyear, who's uh, an executive producer at Edge Media, he was uh, <laughs> instrumental in actually revealing that that thing was a fake. Right. Uh, because yeah. he recognised someone on the tape right. <laughs> who we knew from a TV studio. <laughs> Dear me, yeah. yeah. So, anyway. Yes, carry so, on. Dear. So this was one of the main features events at that early Leeds conference. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's the first time I'd actually seen and heard Linda Moulton House speak mm -hmm. and Michael Hesman, the, the German chappy, they were on the platform extolling the virtues of the... Um, Santilli film, film. Uh, sort of supporting that it was genuine. Yes, and uh, I didn't disagree entirely. And Linda was sort of saying, so you thought it was a fake from the word? Yeah, go. yeah. Right. I mean, and I wasn't impressed with the military XRAF as it was as a photographer. Mm -hmm. I thought no military photographer was going to make such a crappy job <laughs> of such an mm -hmm. important event. If it was real, it would be a really important event. They wouldn't have one camera and handheld and kept going out of focus, mm -hmm. very unprofessional. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, the guy, if he was in the military, would have been bloody court-martialed for the terrible job he did of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, I didn't appreciate then the, the commercial interest that Linda and Michael Hesman had mm -hmm. in, in promoting that and their magazines, websites, well, perhaps websites mm -hmm. weren't going then, but, you know, going on conference platforms. Yeah. So I, I, at question time, I stuck my hand up and uh, uh, said my, my piece. Well, okay. I, I, I think, you know, it was probably not genuine. You know. Right, right. And, and then moving on from that, um, there was a conference at Southport, I believe. Um, yes. <coughs> that was uh, again in the 90s, late 90s. Late 90s. Yeah. yeah. And that was organised by Tim Matthews and Eric Morris. Mm -hmm. And again, it was mainly a Bufora thing. And Harry Harris who I met earlier, mm -hmm. who was into uh, abductees and having them rapidly yes. regress, etc. And Linda Taylor, one of the abductees, and myself were sort of invited to participate. Mm -hmm. um, and because at the end of the conference, they planned uh, an open debate about abductions. Right. And uh, well, the whole thing was a debacle, it was a fight. Right. Two guys gate crashed in right. and uh, started shouting uh, and bawling out at Tim Matthews. Right. Uh, and there was a bit of a fight and a scuffle mm -hmm. while they uh, ejected those guys. Um, and then uh, some Bufora speakers, like there was Jenny Randall, was Peter Brooksmith, mm -hmm. Gloria Dixon, who was the president of Bufora at the time. Mm. And, and alien abduction was one of the main themes of that conference. Then. Well, no, the main speakers were talking about anything. Right, okay. But, but, uh, so Jenny Randall's, and I, I was sh shocked mm -hmm. because in her talk, she started to talk about, Brand about Rendlesham Forest event you know, right. in 1980. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this should be good. I mean, she was directly involved in researching that case in the first place mm -hmm. with Dot Street mm -hmm. and Brenda Butler Harry Harris and I think a retired police superintendent called Norman Collinson, who was friendly with Harry. Mm -hmm. And uh, she produced a book called Sky Crash in mm -hmm. association with Dot Street and Brenda Butler. And they actually got the national press and they ended up with the news of the world to break the news that it was official, a UFO's landed in Suffolk. Right. You know I mean? So having capitalised on this case for so many years, I couldn't believe my ears when she starts to ridicule and debunk the Rendlesham Forest. Okay, so what was her explanation for what the I Rendlesham honestly, UFO was? I honestly was? can't remember. I wish I could. Right, okay, uh, and, and, the, and the, a lot of the Rendlesham witnesses are, I've heard, going to get together <coughs> later on this year, right. all in, in the UK somewhere. I don't think they've announced a, you know, a venue or anything mm. like that, you know, mm. the likes of... Um, Jim Penniston and yes, um, yeah. Larry Warren and yeah. um, you know Charles Holt, all the people who saw mm. yeah. the triangular shaped UFO come and land in, in Reynolds and Forest, yeah. all military, yeah. highly trained yeah. witnesses. Yeah, well, I, I'd met Colonel Holt and we spent some days with him, and he came to do the Strange But True program with ITV mm -hmm. with uh, Michael Aspel. Mm -hmm. And Harry Harris had organised this end and everything, and apart from the TV stuff, we'd had a conference of Charles speaking in, in Manchester, one in Todmorden, which um, uh, Alan Godfrey organised, and Graham Burstall did one for Quest in Leeds. Mm -hmm. And I ferried him around mm -hmm. with Harry and Linda and one or two other people mm -hmm. from where he was staying in, in, in Manchester to the venues. Mm -hmm. And we could set up some 
recording gear, mm -hmm. or a PA system for doing his talks, mm -hmm. apart from the Leeds Quest did their own thing on that mm -hmm. one. So I, I got to know him quite well, and I had no doubt the things he was saying, and having met the man, that it was a genuine event. Okay then, David, well... So to hear Jenny Randall's poo-pooing, it was a shock. Right. So, yeah. Well, we're going to go for a, a short commercial break now, David, yeah. and we'll hear more from David Caton after this break. Don't go away. <laughs> 